Well, I'm very uh, thrilled to be able to come in on three excellent uh, talks. Uh, and I'll give just a few general comments at the end. So starting with Cecile Jensen's talk, uh, Cecile gave a very sanguine and, and appropriately pessimistic uh, talk, in my view. Um, I, think, I think that um, genetics has been very predictive of one thing, which is grant funding success, but not so much predictive of other things, with some exceptions. Um, Cecile talked about polygenetic risk and um, that you can maybe learn something from high dimensional data if you don't try to name names, if, if you don't try to be parsimonious. And that's a theme that tends to run through a lot of different aspects of data analysis. We try to get a parsimonious signal and then we're constantly surprised when the pieces of that signal don't, don't replicate in further research or they have odds ratios of 1.02 and we were able to get a paper naming a name. We named the variant, uh, but the actual value of that uh, sort of diminishes over time. Um, whenever there is a, a weak prognostic value of a set of features such as uh, uh, variants, uh, you have a low, a low yield in terms of prediction, in terms of prognostication. And that means your basis for heterogeneity of treatment effect is even worse, because heterogeneity is, is far harder to estimate than to estimate the overall main effects which go into the prediction. Um, so, and, and there's a real need, as, as Cecile uh, commented, to quantify discrimination well and don't do it in, in highly enriched subsets that make the discrimination look much better than it is. Uh, that was a great point. Um, we see a lot of parallels to what Cecile uh, talked about in the imaging world. And, you know, in imaging, they actually use the phrase double dipping. They're actually very honest about the cheating that they do. Um, and the double dipping phrase probably should be used in other contexts also. But I'll take a moment to pick on Cecile's home institution, where, which published a high profile imaging paper about three or four years ago that was written up in the New York Times where the, the brain region that, that you, can, you can measure activation in that region and tell whether the patient will be cured by psychotherapy versus antidepressant drugs. And uh, needless to say, you'll never see that, that study replicated. Uh, but it's a case study for something else, which is we get involved in sexy things and we forget to do the simple things. So within that paper, um, it showed that uh, patients who have high anxiety levels tended to have much different benefits of psychotherapy versus um, drug therapy. And so here you have something very unsexy that's in a table in the paper with an incredibly significant interaction with treatment benefit that was not commented on because they wanted to concentrate on voxels or uh, detailed imaging markers. Um, I think um, what we have a risk in precision medicine is that we, because of the way it's being attacked, we're going to excel in precision capitalism more than we are in, in, in improving public health. And I think your talk is a wake-up call to that. Uh, Fan Lee gave uh, a really nice overview of flexible methods for looking at uh, differential treatment effect and showing that the machine learning methods, uh, and there are many of them out there, are very, uh, very flexible. Um, and I think one thing that could be added to that is a little caveat that uh, Avalt had a, uh, he was co-author on a paper um, about three years ago called, it had the word data hungry in it. Machine learning methods are data hungry. And he estimated that the sample size needed for machine learning approaches is about uh, 10 times bigger than the sample size needed for regression. So you need about 200 events per variable if you're doing a tree-based method uh, or uh, ran a forest or a support vector machine. So that idea that you need enormous data sets before the machine learning methods will actually validate. In other words, they give you an ROC area of 0.8 and it's not going to be 0.6 when you validate. It's going to be 0.79 or 0.8. Um, needs to be kept in mind because there, whenever you have great flexibility, that flexibility is also a curse because it doesn't favor additivity as we do in regression. That means your number of parameters gets really large. 
Uh, now, um, Fan mentioned some exciting new developments in high dimensional Bayesian analysis methods, um, and those are really non-parametric methods. I think I would just add that to me, the method that has the most promise of anything in this in this space is ordinary Bayesian parametric models, because with ordinary Bayesian parametric models, you are in, inviting subject matter input to specify what is the likely differential effect of each risk factor. So what's the likely interaction effect? So we're going to really spend time talking to the experts. We have 20 potential factors that we might allow to interact with treatment to give us heterogeneity of treatment effect. Uh, but if we just do an exploratory analysis of those 20, and if you have 50,000 variants, you know, it just gets much worse. Um, instead of just having a very undirected analysis, if we use the subject matter expertise to specify the prior distributions for the interaction effects, we'll have methods that are much more reliable and interpretable. And then only when you do that do you have the full uh, machinery for inference from base. So most of the things that we've talked about with machine learning and with things like Lasso, when you're done, you have no inferential machinery, so you don't have confidence intervals, you don't have, you don't have inference at all, you just have prediction. So it's nice not to get rid of the inference. And one of the ways Bayes does this is, if you have an interaction you're not sure should be in a model, you can make it half in and half out. That just means your prior distribution is a skeptical prior for the interaction effect. So you don't have to make the decision about whether it's in or out. Okay. And then uh, Patrick um, covered a lot of good ground, um, and he, he started off with imaging and, and then got into genomics um, and had a nice description about the differences between individual decisions and decisions that relate to groups or populations. And he talked about some metrics. It's very important to choose the metrics you're going to use for looking at the success of whatever you're doing. Um, the individual benefit um, to really estimate that, as he has described, requires you to observe the patient under more than one treatment. And Stephen Sin has written extensively about that and shown, um, and, and you mentioned crossover studies, how important crossover studies are to really get a general estimate of heterogeneity of treatment effect. Uh, other than that, we are dealt, we're having to deal with approximations. And I think of the approximations as when, when you have a patient only under one treatment, it's like an ecological analysis. It's sort of like an analysis on group data uh, when we don't have the fine individual level data for a patient observed under uh, multiple treatments. And then I just want to close with a couple of general things. We need to talk more about what projects to target. So I, I've seen examples in uh, pharma industry and other places where a so-called failed study is targeted for heterogeneity of treatment effect. That's really not a good choice of, of a way to use your time because you have almost no statistical signal in which to base heterogeneity of treatment effect. But a better choice might be to take the very successful studies, especially a cancer study where the company is about to charge 10 times as much for the treatment as they even told us they were, and find out who it doesn't work in so you can save some money. So that would be a great place to apply heterogeneity of treatment effect. So thanks for listening.